It's Flames Nation Radio. Ryan Pike and Shane Stevenson here with you. Uh, recorded in various points in palatial southern Alberta, as seen on HBO. Yes. Uh, and uh, as always, we're brought to you by Eau Claire Distilleries, the makers of Rupert's Whiskey, the official whiskey of the Calgary Flames. Uh, this is episode 70. And uh, Shane, it's trade season. We're about to become trade season. As it, we record it, it this kicked episode, off today. It kicked off. We're, we're recording this episode on Thursday afternoon. Uh, the Vladimir Tarasenko trade has just dropped, uh, which if you are living under a rock, it is uh, Vladimir Tarasenko with half a salary retained to and uh, defenseman uh, Nico Mikkonen. Nicola. Nico Mikola. Ni- Nico, Nico Mikola. Mikola. I'm sorry, Nico. I got your name wrong. Uh, Nico Mikola, who's pretty good. Uh, to the New York Rangers in exchange for uh, a conditional 2023 first round pick. The condition being the Rangers have two first round picks and the Blues will get the later of the two picks. Uh, A conditional 2024 fourth round pick that progresses to a third round pick if the New York Rangers uh, progress a little bit uh, in the postseason, which if you're the Blues, you're probably cheering for them now. Uh, And uh, bottom six forward, uh, Sammy Blaze. Along lies, blaze, lies. Blaze. I think it's blaze. I don't know. It's, it's a French name, and I'm always bad at that. So I, I think it's Sammy. I think it's it's probably actually Blay. Like it's probably just pronounced Blay, and we all say it wrong. Yeah, like that's just, and the thing we've learned. Oh, and and the before we before we uh, forget the last player in the in the trade, uh, prospect Hunter Skinner. He's big and you know, defenseman. He's, he's, he's not bad. Uh, right. I think obviously the exciting parts of the trade, if you're the Rangers, you got uh, Vladimir Tarasenko who can score goals and scoring goals is fun. You have uh, Mikola who can, I think, even upgrade on uh, their on their defensive he's, depth. Nick, he's, an on Hayek. he's an upgrade on Hayek. He's an upgrade on Hayek who they waived. So yeah, and, and they, they, they got a better they got a better Mikola. is good and he's. I don't think he's great at anything, but he's just good at a lot of things. He can give you 15 minutes and you can rely on it, and you're good to go. Like you're you're going to yeah. lean on Adam Fox if there's any real issues. And, and it, uh, so if if you're the New York Rangers, uh, you get two guys that'll help you, and what they're hoping will be a long playoff run. If you're the St. Louis Blues. You give up uh, McCola, who's good, but you're probably thinking about moving him based on his contract status. And yeah. you, you lose you lose uh, a player in Tarasenko, who a uh, a couple of years ago apparently requested a trade, and now is just you know he he they they smooth things over. But I think with him being a pending UFA and probably looking at his future options elsewhere, you got a first rounder and a good draft for him. So. Good for everybody. Like this is this is a trade that feels like it works for both teams, which is the whole point of doing trades. Uh, the I, Blues... I it, it the ripple effect for me is I thought you know the rumors and everything was how much the Rangers were going to be in on Patrick Kane. They don't need that now. They got Tarasenko, and it cost them a hell of a lot less. I'm I'm willing to put money on. Um, so yeah, that that threw me a loop. I'm like, well, it just changes the market, right? Everything's changed now that the one trade's gone through. The prices are set. Because I think we had a depth defenseman trade already to um, Magna to the Kraken. To, to the Kraken. Yeah. For a conditional fourth. So that sets your rental market for lower end depth defenseman. And now you have a premier score going for a first round pick. Now you have a market. The market's set. What is the price going to be? It's... Well, it's there. What in relative in relation to what was happening. They're, the only one that can still change the market and can create his own is down in San Jose. So, And we'll get into that. So, uh, friends, what we're going to get into, since we're three-ish weeks away from the trade deadline, uh, which is March 3rd, 5th. 5th? It's the Friday. It's the first Friday in March. Now I have to look it up, damn it. It's the Friday. It's the 3rd, isn't it? It's, I'm pretty sure it's the 3rd. March 3rd? March 3rd? I'm I literally know, opening a I, spreadsheet when right now. The calendar on it's March third. It just brings up weird stuff. So. It's March third. So hey. March third. So we're about we're less than a month away. Three. Le- we're just over three weeks away. So Shane and I figured, okay, the Flames are what they are. Outside of Rasmus Anderson getting hit by a car, uh, <laughs> been there, done that, buddy. <laughs> but outside of him getting hit by a car, the Flames are largely healthy, and so we might as well just dive into what are our our targets, our hopes and dreams, uh, slash expectations for the Flames and the trade deadline. So Shane and I have both cobbled together a list of three players with zero overlap. We did this independently of each other, and there was zero overlap, uh, which shows you we see things a little bit differently, which is good. Uh, Shane, I'll so I figure Shane, what we'll do 
or go process. Back. We'll go back and forth. I'll start because I'm bossy. Uh, my first gentleman I would look at for the Flames, and I have a list. Uh, my first gentleman is someone, uh, as I open my list, <laughs> I had a spreadsheet open and I closed my spreadsheet and I closed everything. Uh, my first person is uh, a defenseman. So here, here is my here's my thought process. Uh, Jacob Pelche so far has been a good fit for the Flames in their roster. He he's fit. He played pretty well in their fourth line. He's played pretty well in their middle six. He hasn't played on their first line because the first line is really good and they don't want to muck around with it. But he's mm-hmm. played everywhere and he's been effective. So I don't think if I'm the GM and I'm thinking. I don't know if they're making the playoffs. So I'm kind of hesitant to blow my brains out for lack of a better term, throwing, you know, good asset, bad assets after good to try to plug some holes. The nice thing is I really see that the, the big challenge for me is I see their big holes on the, on defense, like just play, own zone play. And so I really like Columbus's Vladislav Gavrikov. I don't, I think he would probably be, of that, that sort of, for lack of a better term, second tier defenseman, like his cap hit isn't too bad. I believe it's about 2.5 mil. Uh, he's a rental uh, and he's good. He's good. He can plug a lot of holes. He can play all over the place. Uh, if you're looking for someone that can sort of ease the burden on Chris Tanev a bit, if you want to get the most you can out of Chris Tanev between now and over the Flames stop playing, whether it's April 13th or whether it's sometime after that, I think you need better defensive depth. We just saw, you know, did, uh, on, on Thursday, the Flames announced that Rasmus Anderson got hit by a car. And you know who was coming in directly from the AHL to play in the third pairing? Dennis Gilbert, which screams to me they don't have a lot of faith or at least willingness to try out uh, Connor Mackey. The die has basically been cast with Connor Mackey at this point. And I think, okay, if you're accepting, like, the premise of you don't know if Shillington's going to be back and if he is back, how good he's going to be right away – and you know Tanev is banged up, and you know that the only guy they really seem to have faith in in the system right now is Dennis Gilbert, who's 26. Bar- <laughs> Bar- putting all those things into context, I think I would put the adding a blue liner as my number one target, and this play style, the play type, the the fit. Gavrikov seems like a guy that would basically he would solve a lot of problems i think the other thing they need to work on is their power play which gavrikov probably won't help with at all that that's another problem they can look at later on but the, the if the idea is you're like man the flames defensive zone play in front of their goaltender is kind of eh, they could get some help with that and you know not really have to lean on zadorov or tanev these guys as much as they have and sort of ease the burden a bit spread out the 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 hard minutes a bit I think Gavrikov would be a good fit there. And I think I, they're, probably, they're I, probably looking at like a second and something to get him. Like I'd say a second and a third or a second and a fourth or a second and a conditional something. If that's the price based on how good he is, I'd kind of be okay with it. I don't think the price tag would be too much between cap hit and between the acquisition price. I wouldn't want to give up a, a heck of a lot more than that. But I, I think my modest proposal is why not Gavrikov? Numbers guys won't like it because it's going to say that he's bad defensively, but you also have to really, really approach it from an outlook of, look how good Columbus actually is this year. And when you see their record and you see how terrible they are, you'll see why his defensive metrics are higher than his usual career average. Back when they were actually trying and he broke into the league, he had positive defensive metrics across the board. Um, when I did a huge breakdown on the defense, uh, Luke Shen, I compared it to how Stone and Good Branson evolved under Daryl Sutter versus their previous coaches. And I found that defensively, it doesn't really actually improve their defense. It just improves their ability to actually gain offense instead of uh, having the one-dimensional shooting on the boards. Gavrikov doesn't have that. Gavrikov does create offense all over the ice. Um, at a positive rate too people people may think he's a defensive defenseman but he's actually a positive impact on offense which would be huge for calgary because he's a better defensive impact player than stone and he's and and with the boost that he would get playing under daryl sutter i believe he would he would be a more impactful addition and if you're going to pay a second i want it to be a guy that's playing every day right like not not a guy that you fill in and rotate i want a guy that's actually going to be there even when they're healthy which would happen if Shillington uh, does not come back. So I, I don't mind that, Pike. Uh, it's not my preference. Uh, I'll counter with my D. Um, he's 
had success elsewhere. He's an analytics darling for a lot of people, yet he still can't seem to hang on everywhere for more than three years. Um, but his Dmitry Kulikov, he can play both sides. He's a left shot predominantly. The Flames actually have three right shots. And if they could build three balanced pairs, uh, I would love that. I don't think they're going to do that. They'll always go Uyghur Tanev and uh, Hannafin Anderson if they're healthy. But I would prefer to see Uyghur Zadarov and then Tanev paired with a younger guy. Um, but I like Dmitry Kulikov. I think his fundamentals are there. He's played for winners. He's played in the playoffs. He's yeah, he's not tiny, I guess, is another thing that would check the box. And he's not slow. He's, he's actual mobile and can make that first breakout pass. So I really like Dmitry Kulikov. He's cheap. He's Here's the thing. Everyone we're suggesting, the Flames don't actually need retention. They can, based on how the cap works, they can actually take them in. And, and it's very hard retention, to explain that. Generally speaking, folks, so... Uh, if if a player's normal price tag, like here's an example, like we used uh, last year, the Flames traded, Shane, correct me if I'm missing a draft pick. They traded for a half routine Cali Yarncroke. It was a second, a third, and a seventh. Yep, that was it. And so it was basically a second, the market price is a second and a third for Yarncroke. And then they had to throw in an extra pick to get the salary routine. And it wasn't that much. He's what He wasn't on a huge cap hit, but the Flames were tight against the cap. So generally speaking, whatever the price tag is, for a player, you upgrade it slightly or throw in another pick to get them to retain. Them to so, retain. like it, the Rangers it, and their fourth round pick included in the Tarasenko trade. I'm pretty sure if you take the fourth round pick and the retention out, it's probably still a done trade, right? Pretty close to it. Oh, so if if you're the Flames, if you're thinking, man, the Flames sure do trade a lot of picks. Man, I sure wish the Flames would, would stop doing that so they could make more picks and sort of backfill their farm system a bit. Disclaimer: I think they've done a good job backfilling their farm system, but I'm a, I'm a draft guy and I'm sympathetic to anyone saying they should make more picks because teams should always make more picks. More is always better when it comes to young players. So if you're saying, man, I really wish that they would, you know, do more picks and stop trading away picks, making trades that don't involve salary retention are helpful. The flames in the event that Shillington does not return, the flames have the ability to use LTI. And so they could get creative basically you know, LT, I, I have an explainer on LTI uh, on the site. Uh, read it. Yeah, it's read very, that. it's it's needlessly complicated because it's meant to basically just be, a, it's, a, it's a CBA tool. It's not meant to be something that you play shell games with. It's basically be essentially, hey, you can, you know, you can replace Shillington with guys making the same amount of money. That's essentially the idea. And the, the intention is you're up against the cap. You lose somebody who's playing every day. You go, oh no, I don't have enough money to replace the guy for six months. And so LTI is meant to make, give you the flexibility to do that kind of thing. Uh, it's gotten weird from some teams who've gotten very creative with it, which good for you, I guess in Tampa, you know who you are uh, for the flames though. They would have the ability in the event that they know if, if they find out that Chillington's not returning at least this season, then they could get creative, but they'd need to do some stuff. We'll get into that later. Like in a, in a future edition of this program, where yeah. I want to bore people to death. If it happens, I, I, if it I happens, really we'll like, break it down. <laughs> I I really like that suggestion. Like Kulikov has mentioned every friggin' year at the trade deadline is to every team is like, why don't we get Dmitry Kulikov? And it's like it's the it's he's the Mike Sillinger of the modern era. And, and you know the, you know the Ducks aren't going to hold on to him. Right, like, like, the ducks like are, the ducks are avid. Mason McTavish is out here talking about Bedard texting him every time they lose. Of course, they're going to get rid of their UFAs. He's thirty-two. He's a veteran, so you know you don't have to worry. Your coach, your coach likes veteran players. He likes them because they make less mistakes, less simple mistakes. So you'd be bringing in a guy. I mean, the other guy, he's not on my list, is Justin Braun. But Justin Braun's thirty-six. So. Yeah, and the money, and and, yeah. and so that that's the other thing. That's why I went with Kulikov. Yeah, and Kulikov. Uh, like yeah, you don't need to like a anything. Pickup. It's we, just, we've it's just we've the discussed cost acquisition. We've discussed Luke Shen too, and mm-hmm. I don't think Luke Shen's on either of our lists per se. But Luke Shen also feels like kind of, Luke Shen is basically the if if you want to have someone who's playing all the time, you you know if you're like oh you want to add a depth of D who can play in your third pair every game you're probably looking at kulikov or gafrikov if you're looking for a six seven someone if you're going man love dennis gilbert but i don't want to have to use dennis gilbert if anything happens to anybody if you want to wow. insulate from dennis gilbert a bit then you do luke shan because luke shan is making no money there'd be no retention needed and 
potentially you could do both. Like you could do I, like we could see them do multiple defensive moves like we've seen in the past. I just think with how this team has utilized the second round of the draft under this current GM, that trading that pick for someone to play 25, 20 games with you, 20, 25 games with you is not worth what the actual future value of that pick could provide based on how would, they draft. And I would so say in this, in this draft, second. like kids, yeah, the 2023 first round is going to be if it if it's anywhere close to expectations, like a friggin' legendary first round. The second round ain't gonna be far off. You're gonna have second rounders this year. Like, let's just if, if, if the Flames oh. if the Flames are a wild card team, if the Flames are one of the weaker playoff teams who make the playoffs, uh, if they don't move their first and the second, you're probably looking at a first rounder at about but 17, 18th overall, because 16 yeah. teams don't make the playoffs. So those are the lottery teams. If you're one of the weaker playoff teams, you're at 17, 18, 19 overall. So we're there somewhere between eight, eight, uh, 17 and 20th overall. So you're going to get somebody good. And then in the and next round, you're looking at, it. yeah, you're looking at what? Uh, 30, 30, yeah, mid fifties. So again, you're going to, this, this draft is considered very deep and very good and then there's sort of a cliff at like 60 so you probably want to this is the year that you probably don't want to move your second and so we got i got a personally a bit of uh a reassurance from comments that brad made in an interview i think with nhl.com with vickers he did a he did a one-on-one with him and it was posted to nhl.com and he said that they don't want to just he's not just going to trade picks just mortgage everything he's like it's got to be calculated he's like i'm not just going to do stuff to do stuff so he, he he's very much, even though contract status and everything, he's very much still focused on the future. And I think Friedman, and I, I've been listening a lot lately because we haven't been talking, and Friedman did point out, someone asked this on the Merrick show, and he pointed out, he's like, wow, you know, that's a good way to not get future jobs. He's like, other guys like to, even if they're not coming back, they like to campaign for future jobs. So peace of mind there, before we move to our next targets, is just I don't think that if the pricing, if the bidding war goes up, Calgary's not going to buy. They're going to be like, well, no, I'm only going to pay the appropriate price for what we need, because if we go up and above and we're this, and we're on the bubble, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, like, I, I get, think they're going go, to do go on a nine game win streak, and I'll go buy you what you want. Yeah, Keep I, up the current pace, and you're going to get what I give you. I think they're going to do something. I don't know if they're going to necessarily do something big. Yeah. Unless they sense. go on a huge win streak, I don't think we're big game hunting here. I think yeah. I think we're dealing with depth prospects, depth picks, and the top stuff is not touched. You might be looking at something like a, a fourth rounder for Jason Magna. Yeah, exactly. It could well, be, and, I, that's, that, and that's Brad's MO with the Gustafson and the four boards and, and the history of it. Uh, fourth fourth round pick for fourth round picks for players. And all those guys are still in the NHL other than Fattenberg. Other than Fattenberg. Oh, Fanty. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, what's your next What's your next target? Play? My next get- target is... Someone who actually has term. This is this would be someone you target more of a hockey trade uh, from the Chicago Blackhawks, Sam Lafferty. This is a guy I wouldn't mind because he has a year left in his contract. I wouldn't mind if you're thinking maybe you want to, you know, send a prospect that way. Maybe you want to. Like if you're talking about depth for depth, I really like Sam Lafferty. The I would say the Flames' best two way specialist outside of Backland this year in terms of specialist is probably Trevor Lewis. Trevor Lewis is 36. He's good. He's a PK guy. He doesn't score a ton, although this year he has. But he's he's basically your tough minutes PK, you know, uh, babysitting the, the kids is when they come into the team kind of guy. And he's been really good at it. But he's 36. So if the idea is you're thinking, man, I really like the things this 36-year-old man does for my hockey club and – special teams are incredibly important in the playoffs and regular season two, but especially the playoffs. I would be a little bit worried that a you're overtaxing your backland and Lynn home where you're probably your most, I'd say your most important five on five players, just in terms of driving the play one way or the other. And they play both sides, of special teams and you have Tana <laughs> and you have uh uh, Manjipani and Dubé and Lindholm and those and uh, to yeah, they all and kill they, you have a, all all the most important Flames players play uh, really on both sides special teams yeah. and adding someone like Lafferty who's on I think just a shade over a million dollar contract for one more season he would give you the ability to stop to lean on those guys a little less it's kind of like what they did with Yarncroke last year where they're like man you need sort of a depth guy who can sort of 
fill in a lot of those minutes and insulate your stars a bit so you don't need to lean on them in the event you're in like a goddamn trench war with Dallas again or another team. Those games, those minutes wear on guys. So if you're going to be spending like I'd be okay with doing a third or a second for Lafferty because you know, Lafferty would play yeah, right away, yeah. and Lafferty's a guy who's going to give you the remainder of the season and one more. If I'm Chicago, I don't know if that's enough. But, again, I think from a pure hockey trade perspective, from a what do the Flames not have that they need? Like, here's a question. Do you think playing the Flame Stars a teeny tiny bit less on the PK would help them be a bit better on the power play? I'm thinking – Maybe. I think it helped me better at five on five too. Yeah. So if, like, if the idea that's is their strength, so. if the idea is you wanna you wanna just spread the minutes around a little bit more on five at five on five on special teams, and maybe it keeps the guys young and fresh a bit for the for power play. And when you have the 25th best power play in the league by by percentages, you kind of need to try a bunch of different things. And this week we've seen the flames come out of the break with really you know mixing and matching their pair their their units so they basically have two like a 1a and a 1b pair uh unit also you could also argue they have a 2a and a 2b unit because there's no unit that is definitively the top unit yet uh i think i think you gotta try a bunch of different things and they've swapped around personnel and i think adding some personnel could really help with that i i, I really like lafferty i'd like it better if he was a right shot and the only thing that makes me that would give me pause about this is if I'm Chicago and I know I have a guy that I got for basically nothing. I think he was in a he was a in an AHL for AHL swap. Yeah, for Alex. Remember Alex Nylander? No, you don't. No one remembers Alex Nylander. But they made their trade for Nylander, and now it's like okay, he's found money for them. And if I'm Chicago, if I've got if I'm trying to, I I'm so I'm gonna I'm gonna rake teams over the coals to make sure I get a good return for him, or I'm not moving him because he has another year left. So every you, you have time, to, you have to... every right. time you tell me a player, I look them up. I look them up on the hockey biz. And I like to look at their heat maps. And your heat maps. I love my heat maps, baby. Micah, glowing endorsement for hockey biz. Anyways, Lafferty on a terrible Blackhawks team, which I think everyone like aggressively bad, like aggressively bad. Patrick Kane admitting he's just it's hard for him to try playing on this team. Bad. Lafferty has positive defensive metrics and positive offensive metrics. Now the offense isn't great, but it's around the net, which I like. Uh, the defense is directly in the slot where he plays center. Um, although he can play left wing as well. Yeah, he'd be a great. He's got a great defensive mind. He, he reminds me of Kyle Yarncroak, except minus the goals. You know, Yarncroak had the previous history of all the years of goals. He reminds me of the same defense that Yarncroak brings minus the ability to actually finish off the chances which is a fantastic bottom six player. And my, my thing though, is his spot in the lineup would be an improvement on a guy that is never leaving the lineup. So fourth line left wing per se, um, he'd be, well, you want to talk about versatility. That's a position currently on the roster that only plays PP two and doesn't kill penalties. And that, that is where you want a penalty killer. So you can ease up on your, upper six uh, if, That's just if, fundamentally if you're, wrong the, if you're spending on Lafferty who's a guy with term left it would be at the expense of guys that don't and one of them is wearing 17 uh, there's another one that's been hurt that you could theoretically justify replacing in Brett Ritchie but I like Brett he, Ritchie. he's healthy now I like Brett Ritchie guys the little things but I don't think he's getting in the lineup unless it's over Trevor Lewis unless they decide they want to swip swap or res- drop Rizicka out Lewis to the middle and then Ritchie on the wing which we've seen yeah. them do before. Well, and and you know maybe maybe like maybe a natural center list, maybe Lafferty ends up taking Rizicka's spot. I th- I think he would give you a lot of different looks and a lot of different options. Mm-hmm. Again though, I, I just be, I'm worried playing, about the price but... tag. I'm I want worried. Rizicka playing, but in the role they're using him at, I'm, I'm, I, I'd prefer. He was so good on the wing. He was so good on the wing as a complimentary winger to whoever he played with, and then he was killing it. And now they're fourth line center, and it's like okay, he, he was okay. killing it. He was killing it for about five games, and then he kind of fell off a cliff a bit. I, I, I the, the the comments and everything is about his work ethic. He's always in the right spot. When you're playing center, you can't always be hunt, running gun on the forecheck. You need to actually have a defensive mind. And I think a lot of the public perception on what he's doing in his offense is because he's being a better defensive player as a center than uh, than trying to be the first shot offense that he was on the left wing. He, he was always the guy to take the first shot. That's why he got a lot of goals and a lot of points because he was creating loose pucks in and around the crease where guys could bang him home. But 
that's the roster and how it's built and how old guys are and how contracts are. Things are fluctuated in a way. There's a bit of honor, I think, inside of it. They're not using the roster as effectively as I think they should, but that's, that's just me. Um, uh, who's your next guy? My next guy is one that we talked about and the rumors are out there. Someone said no, but I, I, Unless it comes from three specific guys. I remember. I remember. So lay it out. Lay it out for us. So he, the Flames lost a massive net front presence, something that they needed back when they lost Matthew Kachuk. Uh, they they need a guy that can also has the brains to be able to play defensively and know exactly how to break out of their own zone. And, you know, you and the same thing with Toffoli. Is, it, is this Love, somebody who's in the past has gotten Selkie trophy consideration? Has he? I don't know. Really? I believe he has. I don't know. I, I anyways I look this, it up. This, this this guy also uh with Tafoli, Tafoli fit so well with Calgary because of his pre- previous relationship with Sutter. There there is a previously long standing relationship on a whole of a line with Nazem Calgary. And that is why I think JVR is a fantastic um fantastic outlook and, and guy to go get because he does that exact thing. He he's just so good in and around the net, his tipping is top notch. His deflections, like he's not Joe Pavelski uh, or Matthew Kachuk for what it's worth was my second favorite. He's, he's top 10. He's a top 10 tipper in the league and his big body doesn't get pushed over. He does get hurt occasionally, but I mean, playing with a guy that you played so many years with guys that got you 30 goals plus Jonathan Huberto. Let's just add that fact. Now the, the other guy on your line would be Huberto. And I think it's the makings for something that could work really well. And that, and that would be the situation where I think if I think you're kind of okay with pushing Pelche down the rotation a bit, if it's well, you, because of a guy like that. Pelche has years of ELC left, and Calgary needs ELC contracts next year. They have to. They're just with how their cap works and how the cap's not going to go up six million. It's only going to go up about one. They need. They're going to need three or four ELCs next year, regularly playing in their lineup. That's not including Rizicka. So. So that alone, I mean, we'll give that gives Pelche an opportunity next year, unless because because you're just just based on sheer opportunity, how the cap I, works. That's I, how I, the cap's supposed to work. I think Pelche is probably up the rest of the year, pretty close to it, unless they I, add someone significant. Unless they add someone significant, and if they do add someone significant, he doesn't require waivers to go down at any point. I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this. So send him back. I, I really like James Van Riemsdyk, who is a Lady Bing candidate, not a Selkie candidate. Yeah, I was mixing up Human Couturier. He's not a center, but JV, JVR is like he's. He's very solid. He's basically, I would describe him as defensively a little bit worse than Backlund, but he's not bad. Offensively, a little bit better than Backlund. And he's kind of a specialist at this point. He's good at five on five, but he's very good in the power play. He's really good right around the blue paint. Uh, well, the having, having someone like potentially, he gives you different looks and you don't really have to rely on just Manchipani and Kadri as being the guy's getting into the blue paint and mucking around. You have a few other guys that could sort of make the goalie a little bit pissed off playing against the flames. And I, you know, I think his veteranness would be something that the flames value and the coach values his ability to play a lot of different situations. Like he's another guy that if you want him to play special teams on either side, he could do it. Uh, he gives you different looks. He did, gives you, he gives you a lot of things. And I think, you know, to be blunt, Philadelphia is a tire fire this year. And I think he'd be excited to get into a different situation, try something new. Like, and, and the other thing is his board play. Calgary plays more along the boards than they play anywhere else in the entire ice, especially in the offensive zone. It's why they have such high coursey numbers is because they're coming off the wall and just taking shots from the wall. Van Riemsdyk's skill is he can not only be great at protecting the puck on the wall, but he's one of the guys like Toffoli that's good at getting the puck off the wall and into a space to actually get a dangerous shot. Same with Kadri. Kadri and him together, fantastic. Kadri is Kadri is one of the best board players in the leagues, which is why I thought he would be a fantastic fit for Calgary this offseason. I remember we talked about he's a high possession player. He prioritizes keeping the puck and and advancing the attack rather than quick rush chances. Ben Reemsdijk fits right into that. And that's the same MO with the backline line. And that's the same MO with the Lindholm line. So even if the natural fit we think doesn't work, guess what? You can try him somewhere else and it's still yeah. most likely would work. Cause that's missing on pretty much a uh, magic is the guy on the back of the line. It's Toffoli's the guy on the top line, but they're still missing a cre- like a real hard gets tons of chances in the crease. And 
So you could use um you could use him there as well. You could use him with Lindholm and Toffoli. He like, is, he, he is one of the Toffoli guys. Places. He's one of the guys from a cap perspective. Uh, he's making seven mil uh, cap hit this year. So you'd need the Flyers to retain. I think they'd do it. I don't know what the price tag would look like for this. And that's the only thing that makes me go, hmm. Question. He's only owed, uh, when I did the breakdown, he was only owed 2.67 million left this year. And Calgary had 4.04. It's the full year cap hit. It's the full year cap hit, so they would have yeah. to retain just to keep the cap down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you're the guy. I, if, I he's, if, he's, you. if he's half retained, like you're probably looking at off the top of my head to get him for what he is, probably a second ish gets him done, maybe a second and, a prospect, and then you probably throw in a fourth to retain half. And that's why that's who I'd use a second rounder on. I wouldn't use that on a depth defenseman that's going to give you 13, 14 minutes a night and, 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 just play third pair minutes future like jay van reemsdyke and what he brings and how he plays that's where I, you're not paying a first this is like the tarasenko is we just discussed earlier that's the market for a first that kind of guy the stanley cup champion high-end offense whatever van reemsdyke's always been a middle six player he's going to put it cost a rental middle six price at best so yeah so yeah two ish that's probably what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, Two, and, and you could, if, if they're interested in any of the B level prospects outside of the Pelche, Zari, Wolf, and um, Coronado, those four are kind of like the no, you better get an actual, like, jig bona fide top six guy back. The other prospects in the pool, the Cole Schwintz, the Emilio Pettersons, the, the, you know, you never know what the other scouts might be into or looking for. Those are other pieces you can use as well. It doesn't have to just be picks. Calgary actually has a ton of young forward prospects. They're just not a level or the, the ones that everyone talks about or knows their name by household. So there's still a lot of guys out there that they could use uh, to potentially facilitate a trade and keep okay. the cost of draft picks down. Here's my third guy. Here's my third guy. I like your, I like your third guy. It's you like crazy. my third guy. So I, I like your third like... guy only because the other guy's not here. I wasn't well, really actually, th- no, I was here. thinking about this, about the flames power play. And then Frank uh, Saravalli over at Daily Faceoff, our dear friend, uh, wrote about this and talked about it on the Daily Faceoff show early this week. So the latest power play sucks. Let's let's not let's we, let's not dress it up anymore. Their penalty kill is very good. Their five on five play is good, but perennially unlucky in all th- in like the, both zones. Uh, but their power play is just not good. If you look at the underlines of their power play. It is a mediocre power play by every measure. It's just it just doesn't generate enough. And so, you, if you're thinking in a close game, one extra power play goal here and there could tilt the game, could tilt the season. It could a, 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 a three weeks of good power play could get them in the playoffs. Three weeks of mediocre power play keeps them out. And that's why I'm looking at John Klingberg. He plays for Anaheim. We're bad, and are probably just looking to sell off everything but the kitchen sink. If, if you're not a under-25 player with a long-term contract that they love, you're probably available if you get a good offer. Uh, Klingberg is, this year, uh, he's regressed. Let's not let's not beat around the bush. He's not the player he was. He's basically a power play specialist at this point. He's he, it's, he's basically Dennis Wideman, except the referees don't hate him as much. Uh, his career trajectory is very similar to Subban. Yeah, I'd say so. Very he, similar. He's, he was always a passable offensive player who is great on the power play. And now he's a below average to replacement level replace a uh, defensive player. And he's still fairly good at the power play. But if you carry him as a power play specialist, maybe plays in your third pair, you take out Michael stone, you put him in instead and you just use, use Klingberg as a specialist. I think there's value to be had there. Uh, he's making 7 million. So you need them to retain half, but he's been bad enough for them that most teams can't afford or might not want. So I can't imagine you're going to have uh, a variable bidding more for him. So you could probably make it happen for like a mid round pick and, or a prospect where he feels like a conditional fourth rounder guy or a conditional third where, you know, you, if you, if the flames advance or he plays a certain number of games or whatever, maybe that price that turns into a second or a third or whatever, but he feels like, if you're in the flames and you need to do something to make your special teams actually special, actually something that 
decides games for you. They they have a guy that could do that. He just shoots left handed. His name is Noah Hannafin. Yeah, but but, that, but they they need an, they need more options. I think they need, again, they need they, just another NHL body on their defense. I will give you that. Just any NHL body. Dennis Gilbert doesn't move the needle. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, and I'll admit this: like Klingberg has four power play points this year. He's it, he's been very blah. Granted, it's on a bad team with a bad power play. His defensive, like this is why I don't. His defense, his five on five defense, is atrocious. You it's need just downright you need bad. to shelter the sweet hell and out of him, and that he scares is me. Offensive zone starts here's, only. Here's like, a question. Here's a question. Would you, if you got a Klingberg and he could move the needle for you, would you do 11 7, 11 forward, 7 defenseman? I don't know who would sit, but that way you could shelter him. No, no, that's, I wouldn't. because that's, you're, you're just wearing out more would, demon that you would, might need later. Would you, would like, we, we, we watched the 04 run. How many, how quick did they run out of demon, Pike? Quickly. They were using, oh, how, they how were using, quicker, ren- how much they were quicker using could you run out if you run in 11 7? And how how much quicker could you run out if you run eleven seven? And with the depth they have, if you run eleven seven, you spread the minutes out though. Yeah, but well, on this one, you, if, still, the idea block behind, shot away. The idea block behind, shot away from a broken the, arm. Well, that's like that. Not every situation. Though. Exactly. Then right? so, you're you're getting hit by a scooter away from being out. You're like uh, what the? I I but, for the record, I've been run over by a car before. Uh, it sucks. It's not fun, folks. Like I got the, the fact that Anderson's making jokes about it with his teammates today is kind of hilarious to me. But like, I hope you're okay, dude. Like, holy shit. But yeah, the I think the thing for me with Klingberg is like, here's here's the big question. Here's the big question: Is he an upgrade over Michael Stone? Like, it, I, as much as the offensively, yes. Defensively, he's a downgrade. And so, is that worth it? Is it is it worth anything more than what you're gonna have to pay to make him retention? In my mind, no. That's that's yeah. my opinion of it. It's so. it'd be of the guys that I'm suggesting, and I don't even argue having seen your list, of the guys we're both suggesting, John Klingberg yeah. would be the biggest roll of the dice. You're betting on him being energized coming to you know little Stockholm and getting in reinvigorated playing with 80% of the Swedish national. And team. you hope yeah. Ryan Huska. Yeah, it might be higher than that. Um, Ryan Huska and Daryl do have a propensity to improve defense. And just because they put them, it's not that they're changing how they play. It's just putting them in the right situations. Like when I broke down Branson, his defensive metrics improved, but they didn't improve magically to acceptable levels. They improved to, oh, we can mask this. Like we yeah. can hide this. We can, we can limit how much. And, and when happening. they got, when they got good Branson, they had a lot of guys who are holdovers who knew the system or had learned the system. And you had guys like, I'll be blunt, having a Shillington on in your lineup with his mobility can mask a lot of problems for the other guys. Having a Tanev, having an Anderson, having, they have a lot of guys who are able to cover up for mistakes of other guys sometimes. It hasn't happened a lot this year because the team apparently, you know, got voodoo cursed or something in terms of their defensive uh puck luck but like i was just it, i'd be worried as many games as kill it as uh klingberg would win you with special teams play how many would he cost you with his play away from the puck i think klingberg's another name that you know the name carries more recognition than the play which raises the price there's always, there's always this perception that oh this is what the guy was and I'm like, he hasn't been that guy. Like Dallas just straight up let him go for like Dallas is competitive and they just let him go. They just were like, yeah, no, we, we just, he's not going to fit and we don't really want to retain him. So that was Dallas after nine years of playing their assessment is we don't want him. And then we go to the market. Nobody else wanted him either. So there's this big thing where like, if you do get him, it shouldn't cost you anything. Because he is not a player that's avidly sought out in the NHL. He he's kind of an outcast. I think he's asking for money similar to what the other top end guys are getting, and it's really come down to the point where his numbers uh, aren't there. His numbers are not. You're not, not there. that top end guy. You'd be lucky to get Morgan Riley money right now, and you're probably after this year in Anaheim. You're not. It's not like when Taylor Hall took the bet in Buffalo. It didn't exactly work out for him. Guess what, John Klingberg? Your bet's not working out too great in Anaheim. 
So I do, I like your premise. I love the, well, what's the closest player out there to replace Shillington with? Because let's be honest, the best person to fix the defense is Oliver Shillington. Like that's, that's my, that yeah. there's no one else you can go out and trade. But, yeah, and, and that but, would fa- be his but failing that, failing that, like when, so. when the, when the flames lost Mark Giordano, they were able to replace in the aggregate because to be honest, they had the depth to do it. They had, you know, it's like they, they gave more minutes to Anderson and Anderson was ready for it. They gave more minutes to Shillington. They gave more minutes to Hannafin. They had four guys, I think, really step up after they lost uh, Giordano. And man, I mean, a lot of it was Huska and Sutter did a really nice job maneuvering around it. But it worked out really well, and I think it was the right move. And it helped the young guys they have take big steps because they were ready for the opportunity. Well, the depth is if Gio wanted to sign in Calgary for two by 7.5, I'm pretty sure they would have done it. I'm just saying that's, that's, that's a little, they mean. wouldn't have the cap space to do it. To leave him in. <laughs> they wouldn't have the cap space to keep him in league. Oh, you're talking, say, you went, said seven, five. I thought you were saying seven. Yeah, 750,000. He's making, yeah, you say seven, you said seven, five, seven fifty is the way you express hundreds of thousands. Of dollars. I, I, I'm all over the place here. It's, it's all good. We're, we're having a good Thursday. Yeah, now, but yeah, I, I, we I both picked you. a dreamer. We did both pick a dreamer pick. Who's here. your third? My third is the guy that everyone wants. Uh, he would system systematically fit perfectly. Problem is, it would cost you. You know all those players I said I didn't want to touch. It would cost a friggin' crap load of them, and that's Timo Meyer. He he's just the perfect plug. He gets the shots. He's a big body. He plays the game the way Calgary plays even as an outcast in his own thing. It's not driven by his line mates. It's not driven from Eric Carlson. It's all him. He's a fantastic player. He costs way too much money. His $10 million, it's $10 million qualifying offer makes him a rental. But because yeah, he still you, has you, control, you, San Jose that, is not asking for rental prices. They're asking for actual prices. And I think that's like, he's so and good. He's, he's so high. good. And, and if a guy like that's available and you're you have the asset and the spaces and you're that like a piece away, go and get him. In any other year, like say if this was last year with last year's draft, granted they used the last year's first rounder on Toffoli, which I think was the right move because he had it two was, and a half years left his contract. It is the right uh, move. But like in any other draft year, if you said to me, okay, uh Timo Meyer's available, the flames are a piece away. Are you cool with a fir- a conditional first or like a second that turns into a first and a prospect and a roster player? I go, if you think you're a piece away, he's the guy you grab. Yeah. I, Unless I, you, you think that you're a piece away, though, you don't do it. I don't think they're – I think they're asking for more than that. Because the roster player, top-level pick, top prospect is usually what it is for a rental. You, typically for like a super high-end playing out of their mind rental. I think they – because he's technically an RFA and they could qualify him if they want. I don't think anyone will – and then re-sign him, I think that raises I think that means they want one more piece. They want another quality piece, whether it's a second round pick, a B level prospect, something. And, and even then that's not enough to deter if you're the New Jersey Devils, why isn't that done already? Like 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 you've got Jack Hughes and Nico Hishu. You're not you've got I your think centers. teams are waiting for the price to come down. I don't know if it's coming down. I don't think it's gonna come down. I think but the other thing is it makes more cap space if you have it, and I'm pretty sure the devils do. I, I really think he's going to end up a devil. It just makes sense. It, now, he I feels love like a I'm New surprised. Jersey devil. I love when I'm surprised. Because like I said earlier, the whole Patrick Kane thing, that's now wide open. I was like, in my mind, I'm like, Rangers have the assets for him. They have the willingness to get the right winger. That's who they'll probably go get. They went and got Tarasenko. They went, screw that price. I ain't paying that in a flat cap. Maybe, and we're... I'd say I'd say it might not be about the price. They might just not want to wait anymore. They might, you know, because by the sounds of it, it's like, oh, Kane and Taze won't make their decision until about ten days before the deadline. If I'm any team that's thinking about them or needs someone who plays a similar position, I don't want to have, you know, yeah, the, well, the, the hey, trade, I, de- I, I the trade want deadline. Right now. The I trade deadline is forty two days away from the end of the season. Ten days is fifty two days. Right now, we're about seventy some days away from the end of the season. I want the extra 20 days. I want the extra days to integrate these guys. That's why that's why Brad Living made the, the Toffoli trade last year on Valentine's Day. And he didn't want to twiddle his thumbs, wait around, and then have two weeks less to integrate guys into his team. And he didn't put them directly in the lineup. He didn't put any of them directly in the lineup. He gave them time to like, okay, come watch a game first. Watch what we do. I want you to sit there. I want you to watch us. And then when we do insert you in the lineup, you have a better understanding and you're up to speed with the standard that we have set. I'm pretty sure that's when wrong. Come, when I'm you come sure from a non-playoff, they, they put to Foley in right away. 
Toffoli? No, I think Stafford did. When you pretty sure. I know they didn't put Yarn Croak in, and then Ryan Carpenter spent most of his time in the press box. Um, did they get a D man last year? They didn't, right? They didn't because no. they, they had didn't. the they had the league's best defense last year. Yeah, we yeah, we were killing it <laughs> with Eric Branson made us fall apart. No, it's Shillington. Um, we are we, I want him back so bad. Um, but yeah, it, it, Meyer is the perfect fit, but it's too much of a cost, and it Calgary alone just to get him on the roster this year would cost you other pieces, a major piece. One you of the top, yeah, you. You, if you're not qualifying him, like you're blowing your brains out to get him, you're losing Coleman, Dubé, uh, Lindholm, Toffoli. You're losing one of them. Yeah, to make uh, it happen. Tyler Toffoli was traded for on Valentine's Day. He played on uh, the 15th in Calgary. Oh, he did. Okay, I I can't remember. Someone got they traded for someone and they sat him and they said, "Watch." They said, "We want you to watch first. We want to get you up to speed." It might have been Ryan Carpenter. Uh, I might be thinking of Blake Coleman in the preseason. I might be thinking of Coleman in the preseason because they, they didn't play him right away. They wanted to rest him and let him get up to speed. I think Ca- they did the same with Caudry this year, like let him rest. I think that's what it is. Because I'm like, in my mind, there's this part of the Flames organization where they're like, we don't need you to just rush into this. Let's like watch a bit. Let's let's learn. Let's not make this work. And that doesn't hurt anybody to actually do that. It's It's crazy to throw someone that's playing – one's type of running gun offense into a fucking okay well let's be defense first and expect them to fit with no mistakes right it's you got to have the proper communication and stuff there too to make to make it work um and then the players got to be able to do that and have have at some point in their yeah, and history Yarn, shown Yarn, the Yarn, Croak went, Yarn Croak went straight into Carpenter got sat for a little bit because they had enough guys well and then the, what didn't impress enough in practice that the coach he, was, he was he was fine you know fourth fourth rounder for a guy who was fine it i mean was, it was depth if they needed him he would gone in like it's yeah. what it is. it's insurance Depthy depthness you pay yeah. for your insurance you don't see it okay shane let's let's shift gears for a second uh let's talk about some some betting topics thanks to our friends oh, that way i i had some here, here, here's my question for you so i have two questions for you as our resident yeah. uh, betting guy so two questions. One, does anybody bet on All-Star Weekend? Because I know that that some places offer odds on skills comp. I know some of them offer odds on the actual three-on-three tournament itself. It seems, especially the skills comp, seems like such a crapshoot. I'd be terrified. I'm not betting on anything. Especially especially because Kevin Fiala took Kaprizov's spot in the um Kaprizov didn't do any of the skills comp too no Kaprizov traded with Fiala three minutes before he was supposed to do it three minutes before you can't bet on that like it needs to be let's I I was very upset with the NHL's all-star weekend personally I felt it was slow it was sluggish like you're not really and no one tried like that's the thing you can't bet on something when no I, one actually the, the, the mid mid-season all-star weekend like I think like the NFL awesome. does it right. The the start, it, the vibes were awesome. They were on the beach in Florida. Everyone was actually enjoying themselves. And then the skills competition came in, <laughs> and they did the breakaway challenge in spurts. And let's be, the judges they grab are terrible. They, they just whatever. And then they, they lost a judge, and they threw the Arkells guy in there. I'm pretty sure they have him in a cage somewhere, the NHL, because he's always the guy they use for their promos. Them, them <laughs> and Green Day for some reason. Yeah. And and um, it just, it just the entire flow to everything just was terrible. Like, like tell the guys, like, okay, get, go out and try. But, like, let's make this quick. Like, get there, get ready, get going. Like we we don't want you to hurt yourself, but we you know you're supposed to display your skills. I'm pretty sure half of these guys try more in their team on team skills competition to bet one up their buddies than they do at the actual All Star game when you're you supposed. Know, you to know what be I you know what I want to do. You know what I want to do. If I was in charge of the NHL, you know what I do. I want every team to do an internal like you do it in in, in the community. You, like you break you, you open up a practice, you use skills competition, you sell tickets, you raise money for your local foundation, whatever, and then. Do, do the same events that they do at the NHL skills competition, and the winners go there. Like, the winners advance. Like, I mean, some guys will just have schedule conflicts or whatever, so they can't make it or whatever. But I think it, unless it's – like, because I want to see the best of the damn best yeah. do all these things. Like, Who the, the 20 fastest teammates. guys, the 10 fa- – like, figure out a way to – figure out how to produce that. Do the All-Star game as its own thing because I think, you know, it's it's awkward. 
The whole thing well, was just awkward. I only watched a yeah. little bit of it because I was on vacation. It, yeah, I, la- I watched, uh, I'd say, the majority of it. And then I got, and then I went and watched Connor Bedard's Point Streak End, which fantastic stuff. Yeah, finally get to go watch him. No points. Defensively, best player on the ice. Uh, people razz on him all the time. He's, he's good at everything. Yeah. Um, um, okay, the other- going back to the betting point of it, uh, I'm sure some people – convince themselves to bet on all-star weekend i think that's a colossal waste of money I, okay I here's, here's the other thing so we're heading we're three weeks away from the trade deadline here's my question i have like if you're if you're say the calgary flames you're a flames fan you're you're approaching a game where the flames play anybody who has a player who might mysteriously disappear before puck drop i mean Obviously, you know, we're dealing with the, the restrictions we are with the, the NHL announced basically locking in rosters like five minutes before puck drop. I mean, or five minutes before the broadcast window opens. It's very, it's very tight. And we get it. There's reasons for that. But this is the time of year where I'm like, you're betting on, you know, player props. You're betting on, sh- you know, game. Like most of the, if you're, if the, the teams that are selling off everything with the kitchen sink, if you're Calgary and you're playing Anaheim, I don't think the, the money line on the, on the game is, really changing that much if yeah oh no john kleinberg's gone but it could impact a lot of little the games within the games and that'd be the kind of thing that i'd be i'd be nervous about if i was if i was a regular gambler let's let's use san jose as an example because timo meyer is a high high shot generator like maybe outside of ovechkin in his prime one of the better ones in the league at just getting tons of shots if i'm betting on the san jose sharks pregame say 30 minutes before and the shot props. Oh, it's only 34 shots for San Jose to hit this prop bet. Then Meyer gets pulled from the lineup. I want that back. Right. I'm like, well, that's six, seven shot opportunities right there. If now, if you bet specifically on the player, like say I bet on Meyer to get four and a half shots plus, and then the players pulled from the lineup, that's just a void. Like, they don't actually keep your money. They just give you your money back. And they're like, okay, well, no, he didn't play. So it's a, it's a in void bet. And you just get your money back. So yeah, betting be, on the player himself, it's fine because you will be still ever betting on team things like what I do to get a lot of them. The goalie, sh- the shot props is huge. I think you ask if you ask Zach Lang at Oilers Nation if you watch his uh, Betway bets of the day videos, it's a crap load of shot props because they're the easiest yeah. to predict. You could see a player's history, except in it. this friggin' three week period, especially the last week. Where guys oh, will yeah. turn into ghosts right before puck drop, they'll be pulled from warmups. Like a lot of weird stuff's gonna and, happen. Well, this is this is why I think the NHL is eventually, if they want to be as heavily partnered, and I've seen a thousand Gretzky, McDavid, MGM commercials. If they want to be that heavily invested with betting, then they're going to need to be like the NFL, and you're going to need to finalize those rosters an hour before, like a decent amount of time. And that includes your starting goalie, your starting roster, and everyone that's going to dress about an hour before the puck drops. No substitutions afterwards. Like, there is no substitutions barring an absolute... You you broke your leg playing sewer ball, warming up. Like, that's the only exception. That roster needs to be locked into place, and the coaches aren't going to like it, but it'll make you more money, and it will yeah. advance uh, the betting, the, and it'll uh, help the uh, NHL. Uh, we've profit. had this conversation before. I think a compromise might just be, you got to lock in and warm up. And that might be it. That might that's be the thing. thirty. That's about thirty minutes. That's that's that okay. might be the I'd best like you get. Little, that I might actually, be the best you get. I mean, I doubt that you'd have to get the PA involved to change when they warm up. Like, hey, can we push it ahead? Can you guys warm up? Finish your warm up an hour before, and then stay warm on the bikes for an hour. Like, it's it did. It, you'd have to. I don't think the PA would ever let that happen. They'd be like, just leave our stuff alone the way it is. But I do agree. Something needs to be finalized with enough time for the public to bet if you're if you want to be a betting league and, and, and dr- been driven by betting revenue then you need to cater to them a little bit which means the head coaches need to they can get punched in the gullet basically so <laughs> like hey someone's gonna it, it to to advance and change the change is going to neg- negatively affect someone somewhere that's the coaches and their preferences and guess what to a fan and probably most of the other fans they don't care like and oh your job your job got a slightly forget, harder. Let's not forget one in, one in very important thing: the coaches don't have a union; they don't collectively bargain. And so, if you're the league and you're worried about pissing somebody off, you're probably going to piss off the people yeah. you don't have to negotiate a CBA with. 
the refs have a union, the players have a union, uh, the management. The refs, I mean, don't, have, the the refs don't have the refs kind of have a union. It's it's a quasi union. It's yeah. an associ- the NHLPA is a flat out union. The the official association is mostly a union because I believe they do collectively bargain. The coaches association is basically just a, an advocacy group. Hey, you're part of the club. What yeah. do I get? Here's your member card and a five dollar gift certificate to Chili's. Have a good time. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you a blooming onion. <laughs> yeah, I think Shane. Exactly. I, I think I think we've hit on what we need to hit on. Uh, friends, best wishes. Hope everyone had a good All Star break. Uh, and 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 uh, make sure you follow along uh, this wonderful podcast. Follow, rate, comment, subscribe, all those fun things. Uh, make sure you follow the Flames Nation YouTube channel because for lack of better term, we have a crap ton of content. Uh, if, if you subscribe, you will get notifications when there are new editions of Flames Nation Radio, Flames Nation Live, uh, Burn Burner, Afterburner, uh, and the newly launched Flames Nation Citizens with uh, Princey Michaela. Uh, yeah, we 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 uh, we locked in the the Flames anthem singer to uh, to do a podcast with Princey. Uh, the first episode's up. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's a completely new energy that we don't have in a lot of the other podcasts, and I think it'll be a really fun addition. And spoiler, uh, there's other things in the works that I've been sworn to secrecy about. Uh, but I can tell you a lot of people are thinking are going to have a blast with them. So, uh, subscribe now and you'll get in, you know, more or less on the ground floor of all the cool stuff we're doing. And we're going to keep ramping up with new stuff, uh, leading up to hopefully, uh, covering some playoff hockey. Hopefully, uh, we're no cheer for the team. We cheer for being busy and we prefer to be busy for a while. Uh, but we have no control over that. Uh, Shane. I hope you had a great all-star break. I spent mine in Hawaii with my uh, my niece and my nephew and their parents and, and my my spouse. And uh, children are fun, but they're also very loud. And if you take a red-eye flight chain, uh, it's going to screw with your – it's going to screw with your sleep schedule. It's just uh, – I was just – I was a zombie I travel, The farthest I travel is to go home to Hannah, where I'm playing, I believe, fellow Nation Network podcast host uh, Jay Rose Hill on Saturday. I don't think he knows that. Um, him in the old Please. auction market. Glenn Cross has played in this turn, this Cowboys tournament. It's more about the beer than the hockey. All I know is uh, play nice with Jay. Uh, well, I, I don't think I think I'm I I have to be more worried. They're fighting shit. I've watched him play in the NHL before. I I'm more scared <laughs> for my health than I am anyone <laughs> else's. But I agree. No red eyes for me. I just drive three hours back to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Different structure from folks. Folks, thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back in a week with another brand new edition of Flame Station Radio. Uh, as always, we're brought to you by Eau Claire Distillery, the makers of Rupert's Whiskey and other fine products. Uh, Rupert's Whiskey is the official whiskey of the Cowrie Flames. And uh, we'll talk to you guys in a week. For Shane, I'm Ryan. Thanks for joining us. 